Good morning, everybody. It's good to see you here, and I'm, uh, I want to thank you for your faithfulness on uh, your being here every week and singing praises with us. Um, it's good to praise the Lord together. Yes. Amen. Never forsake the gathering together of the saints. With that, let us stand and sing a praise to the Lord, the Almighty. church. Good morning. Okay, today's call to worship is Isaiah 53, 10 through 12. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life a guilt offering, he will see his offering and prolong his days, and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. After the suffering of his soul, he will see the light of life and be satisfied by his knowledge. My righteous servant will justify many and he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will give him a portion among the great, and he will divide the spoils with the strong, because he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors. For he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. Thank you, Jesus, for doing that for us. <laughs> Well, I sought the Lord, and he answered me. Save me. 
Would you turn to the fellow worshipers around you and give a big old happy greeting?
right. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Winthrop Street Baptist Church. Glad to see all your smiling faces this morning. Maybe your smile is just frozen in place. <laughs> Spring is coming someday, right? All right. Well, welcome again. A couple of announcements this morning. We're continuing the evangelism class uh, after the service today in the back in the children's church. Uh, the topic is on church, the church's witness. So please join us for that class afterwards. And then just a further reminder, um, next Sunday, the 25th at 9 a.m., we're going to have a Zoom call with Crick Poirier. He's going to be in Estonia, live from Estonia. It's probably dark there. It's like if you guys are, have like the winter blues in New England, just be in Estonia where it's dark for like six months. So, <laughs> But uh, we'll come bright in ch uh, Crick's Crick's day that, that morning. It'll be his evening, but it'll be our morning. So come and join us for that. It's great to hear from him. Um, and then the Secret Sister program is continuing on. Shh, secret. Uh, I think it's for the ladies only, so men, block your ears. Um, if you have more details, see Katie. She's, she's in charge of this. She's very secretive. She's like a spy. <laughs> uh, but that sounds like a lot of fun, so if you're interested in that, sign up um, and see Katie for more details. Uh, we're going to continue through the Gospel of Mark. We're in Mark 14. I'll be reading from verses 26 through 42 this morning in the ESV version. And this is Peter's denial. Ooh. All right, 14, 26. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. And Jesus said to them, you will all fall away. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep will be scattered. But after I am raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. Peter said to him, Even though they all fall away, I will not. And Jesus said to him, Truly I tell you, this very night, before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. But he said emphatically, If I must die with you, I will not deny you. And they all said the same. And they went to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. And he took with him Peter and James and John and began to be greatly distressed and troubled. And he said to them, my soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch. And going a little farther, he fell on the ground and he prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me, yet not that I will, but what you will. And he came and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Could you not watch one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And again he went away and prayed saying the same words. And again he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were very heavy, and they did not know what to answer him. And he came the third time and said to them, Are you still sleeping and taking your rest? It is enough, the hour has come. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. Lord, bless your reading this morning. Join me in prayer. Lord, the, the key verse, there's probably a lot of key verses, but the, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And don't we all feel that, Lord? We, we want to obey. We want to honor you with our lives. We want to bring you glory. We want to proclaim the good news of Jesus to a, a lost and dying world. And that's our spirit. That's our heart. But then we get scared and we get nervous, so we don't know what to say. And, and our flesh kind of takes over and we shirk away or we're quiet. Um, or we fall into a temptation or a sin. Um, but you are so gracious, Lord. This does not surprise you. Even though we sometimes surprise ourselves, you are not surprised. That's why you sent your son for us, Lord. So we thank you. And we, we see the greatest example of Peter seeing, being with Jesus and seeing the miracles and seeing the power that he just displayed and raising people from the dead. And, and he just wanted to trust Jesus with all of his life. Uh, but then when the time came and, and he got accused, he just turned away and said, denied Christ, and, and how terrible that sounds, Lord. Uh, but in God's graciousness and in Jesus' graciousness, he, 
He restores his faith in Jesus, he, in Peter. He restores him uh, and, and doesn't condemn him, um, but extends grace to him. And, and that's what he does to us. And we just thank you for that, Lord. And we thank you that we could proclaim your truth here this morning. Touch our hearts and our minds and remind us of your goodness and your love for us, Lord. Um, Jesus is getting ready to be arrested. and He's going to go to the cross, and he does it for us. He loves us so much that he lays down his life for us, Lord. And what an awesome truth and blessing that is. May that encourage us today and this week. Help us to be a light. Uh, pray for all those churches that are proclaiming the good news this morning. May your grace be upon them and use them in a mighty way. Uh, we know the world is dark and needs a redeemer, and we have that truth. So we pray that you use Winthrop Street to proclaim it uh, and use each of us where you've placed us to be a light for you, Lord. Uh, help our lives bring you glory in all we do and protect our minds and our actions this week. Uh, that we bring you glory more and more each day and help us to be in your word. Strengthen us. Holy Spirit, fill us and encourage us to be in your word every day, Lord. We want to be seeking you. We want to be living for you. And your word is the power to do that, Lord. So thank you. Bless the rest of the service this morning. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <laughs> if everybody could please stand and we'll sing together our doxology. Praise God. Kids can be dismissed to Children's Church. You guys can make your way back there. And if this is your first time here, I just want to say welcome. My name is Pete. I'm one of the pastors here. Glad that you're here with us. And I just want to add another detail about something Justin said about um, next week at 9 o'clock. We'll be Zooming with Crick Poirier. But if, you, if you've recently caught the news, I don't know if you saw that Russia put the Prime Minister of Estonia on some hit list or something. So we're going to want to be there on time uh, to hear from Crick and to pray for him with how close they are to Russia and the uncertainty going on in that area. Just an encouragement to, for us to be there and, and support this brother in Christ, this missionary uh, there. So that'll be 9 o'clock next week. We'll meet in the Children's Church room back there. But we'll love to have you there. Um, let's continue on in Mark chapter 14 is where we are here this morning. Mark chapter 14, verse 26 is where we're going to start. Since the 1970s, <clears throat> there is one terribly detrimental feeling that has been on the rise. It's actually an ep epidemic, and it has a devastating overall effect on our public health. Does anyone know what that is? Loneliness. I think I heard someone mumble it up front. Loneliness has been increasing long before the pandemic from a few years ago, long before cell phones, long before video games and screens. Did you know that 60% of people report being lonely? 60%, so that's more than half of this room. And there are many contributing factors to this. You know, people are busy with work, other activities, which can be harmful to actually connecting with people person to person. You know, the technology that we have that was meant to bring us together has instead cause people to connect through technology, and they miss out on real life connections, and it actually creates more loneliness. There's the rise of artificial intelligence, and virtual reality is only going to breed more loneliness. Like, did you know that there are people who actually interact with artificial intelligence and artificial people instead of talking to real people? You know that happens? How sad that is? You see, we were created to live in relationship and fellowship with each other. And when we feel lonely, it can actually have negative effects on our physical health. People who report feeling lonely are more likely to experience dementia, heart disease, and stroke. The Surgeon General says that reporting that you feel lonely is like smoking 15 cigarettes a day in terms of its impact on our health and well-being. 
The loneliness is felt across all ages. It's an epidemic. People are stuck looking at screens instead of connecting with people. And we see it all, all over the place in public. You know, people are looking down at their screens. They have their earbuds in. They have a glazed look over their face. It just breeds loneliness. Loneliness has always been a human problem, but it's one that I think is getting worse and worse. Did you know that Jesus experienced loneliness? He was not immune to the pains of isolation. He felt sadness. He felt emptiness. He felt disconnected from those around him. Isn't it exhausting to feel lonely? But Jesus felt it like no one else did. He carried that weight upon his shoulders in that he was both God and man. It made him feel totally misunderstood and isolated from the people around him, even though he was the Messiah and the King of the world. Jesus felt lonely. So if you are one of those 60% of people that feel lonely today, know that Jesus can identify with us. Amen? Let's pray and get into God's word. God, as we open up your word here this morning, we do just confess our, our need for you and the loneliness that all of us feel to a certain extent, that isolation, the separation, the the feeling that no one else understands us and gets us. Lord, we bring that to you today, knowing, Jesus, that you have experienced everything that we do. And we pray that you would bless us as we hear now your word preached. As we come from busy weeks, many things on our minds. Lord, I pray that you would help us to put those things aside, help us to love you with all of our mind. Lord, there are so many things on our mind. So here this morning, as we listen to your word, God, we pray that you would help us to love you in all areas of our lives. We pray this, Jesus, for your great name. Amen. So we, we see the king predicts his loneliness. It's the first movement of our passage here today. The king predicts his loneliness. Jesus and his disciples, they had just finished the Passover, and it was reinterpreted as the Lord's Supper. And the meaning of the bread and the cup, they pointed directly to Jesus as the source of redemption for God's people. <clears throat> they finished the dinner, and Jesus and his disciples, they probably sang one of the final psalms, which was part of the custom. So it would be, you know, I think it was Psalm 115, 116, 117, and 118 is how they finished their, uh, the Passover meals. And then verse 26, Mark writes, it says, And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. And according to tradition, those that were celebrating the Passover, they were to stay in Jerusalem for this special night. And since it's now midnight, Jesus and his disciples, they head toward the Mount of Olives to the Garden of Gethsemane. And on the way, Jesus makes a prediction that shakes up the disciples. Look at verse 27. And he said to them, you will all fall away. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered but after I'm raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. So based on what we heard in the upper room last week, during the Passover, not only will Judas betray Jesus, but they will all betray Jesus. The verse that's, that's uh, mentioned here is from Zechariah uh, chapter 13, verse 7, the Old Testament prophecy, which says, Strike the shepherd, and the sheep will be scattered. Zechariah was pointing forward to the martyrdom of the Messiah. And we can figure out the image based on other passages in the Bible. We know from John chapter 10, what did Jesus say? He said, I am the good shepherd. The sheep lays down his life, or the, the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. And this is the same image from Zechariah. But in Zechariah, the image takes a different perspective where the father will strike the son the son who is the good shepherd. And the suffering and death of Jesus is ordained by God and authorized by his divine will. And God uses the evil intentions and actions of sinful man to bring about the greatest possible good in the saving of sinners. So as God the Father strikes the son, the shepherd, the disciples, who are the sheep, will be scattered. So when the shepherd is struck, the sheep will run away. And we know this image. Sheep, they look to their shepherd for their entire existence. 
without the shepherd, sheep are helpless and hopelessly unable to provide for themselves, and they are in clear danger. Well, look at what Jesus says in verse 28. He says, But after I am raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. So Jesus is already saying that hope will not be lost for the sheep. The shepherd will not leave them. And Mark 14, 28 is just another prediction by Jesus of his resurrection. Even though the disciples can't fully grasp what's about to happen next, we can look at the scene and just marvel at the foreknowledge of Jesus. He knows everything that would happen. And even though the sheep will be scattered, Jesus will gather his people again. And this is what Jesus plainly says in John chapter 10. Look at John chapter 10, verse 14. If you want to turn there quickly, I'll read it for us. It's in the same section where Jesus shows himself as the good shepherd. John chapter 10, verse 14. Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. I know my own, and my own know me. Just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. And I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life, that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my Father. So you see, Jesus again predicts his resurrection. His resurrection that he will come back, he will lay down his life, and then he will take it back up again. And this is the confidence that Jesus has in the plan of God. That he knows that violent death awaits him, but he also knows that he will rise again and live out this resurrection life, and he will meet the disciples again in Galilee. And most of the disciples, they live in Galilee. This is why he said he'll meet them in Galilee. He knew that Jesus, he, Jesus knew that they would go back to their home after the Passover and after his death, and that Jesus will meet them there. So the shepherd will return for his lost sheep, and he'll gather them together, and then he'll recommission them for the work of taking the gospel to the nations. Now, naturally, the disciples, I think, are too stuck on the first part of what Jesus had told them. Remember, he told them that they would all fall away. And so here's Peter then, the de facto spokesperson for the disciples, and also the source of Mark's information for this gospel. And Peter steps up and says, in verse 29, Peter said to him, Even though they all fall away, I will not. Jesus said to him, Truly I tell you, this very night before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. But he said emphatically, if I must die with you, I will, not, I will not deny you. And they all said the same. You know, I think that we're so familiar with Peter's eventual denial of Jesus that we can dismiss his words here. We can laugh at him, or even worse, maybe elevate ourselves in self-righteousness above Peter. But I think his words here show he desperately wants to remain loyal to Jesus. He truly does. He wants, to, he wants to stay faithful to Christ until the end. Even if all the other disciples leave him, Peter wants to stay with Jesus. Now you'd think that the words of Jesus in verse 30 would change Peter's mind. But in his mind, he was so steadfast that he even raised the stakes even higher in verse 31 and says, if I must die with you, I will not deny you. And from the other gospel accounts, when Jesus is arrested in just a few hours, what does Peter do? He takes out his sword and he cuts the ear off of a servant of the high priest. Peter viewed this as a battle for the purpose of religious and political liberation of the Jewish people from the Roman oppression. And so he's saying, even if I have to die with you, I won't deny you. But don't misunderstand it here either. It wasn't just Peter who said these things. And not just because my name is Peter, but I think he kind of gets a bad rap sometimes. <laughs> Look at verse 31. At the end, and they all said the same. They all said the same thing Peter did. 
they proclaimed to Jesus they would stay with him even if they must die. They thought they had counted the cost to follow Jesus, but didn't fully grasp what that meant. You know, I think we all would like to think that we would have said the same thing and acted in the same way that, that they did. Or, that, or I think that we would want to act differently, but in reality, we would probably do the same thing that they did. You see, Jesus knew the path forward. He knew everyone would leave him. He knew that he would experience ultimate loneliness. And Jesus also knew that he would provide the gracious forgiveness and restoration that his disciples needed and that we need. Jesus accepted the fact that he would be abandoned and left alone so that you and I would never be abandoned or left alone. That's why the words of Hebrews 13.5 are just beautiful to us, where God says, I will never leave you or forsake you. See, Jesus was our, is our shepherd. Jesus was struck, and we are his sheep, and his sheep are scattered, and they depart from him momentarily, but Jesus will never leave us or forsake us. Amen? That in love, he comes to rescue us and save us. And so the king predicts that he will be alone. The king also predicts that he will be alone in agony. And this is the next movement in the scene, that the king is alone in agony. So the scene moves to the Garden of Gethsemane. And I think we'll never know the true depth of agony and pain that Jesus, our Savior, felt and endured on that night. On that night when he endured this pain and agony for the sake of his love toward us as sinners. So here it is, it's midnight. Jesus takes his disciples to Gethsemane, which is a garden that was located on the Mount of Olives, a place that they'd all gone together before. And the purpose for Jesus leading them there is to pray. Look at verse 32. Mark writes, And they went to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, Sit here while I pray. And he took with him Peter and James and John and began to be greatly distressed and troubled. And he said to them, My soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch. And these are, these are precious verses, aren't they? See, Jesus takes his inner circle, Peter, James, and John, tells them to keep watch while Jesus prays. Mark says that Jesus was distressed and troubled. And I think that's an understatement. He was so sorrowful that he was close to death. Jesus knew what was coming. He knew what, was, what he would experience. And nothing in the Bible compares to the agony and anguish that Jesus felt here in Gethsemane. No human being, however great the anguish, has experienced anything like Jesus did. Look at what, his, what Jesus said to his disciples. He said, my soul is very sorrowful even to death. Now it's hard for us to comprehend, but the sorrow that Jesus felt was life-threatening. And we know that we may think that's impossible, but we know from modern studies that loneliness has physical effects on our health. So I don't think it's a stretch for Jesus to say that he was sorrowful even to death. I mean, we can never imagine the terrors that Jesus felt and that he, was, that he knew he was facing with the cup of God's holy and infinite wrath being poured out onto him. And Mark takes us even deeper into the terrible mystery that Jesus experienced in the garden. Look at verse 35. And going a little farther, he fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this, remove this cup from me. Yet not what I will, but what you will. Peter and James and John, they, they all saw Jesus fall to the ground in prayer, first to his knees and then his face hit the ground, and he prayed repeatedly and loudly. 
Hebrews chapter 5, verse 7 describes this moment. It says, In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death, and he was heard because of his reverence. Luke 22 says that Jesus was only a stone's throw away from the inner circle, from Peter, James, and John. They could see him fall prostrate on the ground. They could see his tears. They could hear his cries to the Father. They could see the sweat falling to the ground, sweat that eventually turned into blood, which is the physical phenomenon called hematidrosis. This happens when someone sweats blood from their skin. Tiny blood vessels in the skin break open and the blood gets squeezed through the sweat glands. Doctors think that it's caused by extreme stress and distress, such as facing death, torture, or severe abuse, which is exactly what Jesus knew he was going to endure physically. But I don't think that, it, that he was stressed about the physical aspects of the cup that he was going to drink. The cup that Jesus prayed to be removed wasn't the cup of physical pain that he would endure on the cross. I mean, many, many martyrs for Christ have gone to their death with thanksgiving and joy without any indication that they were trying to avoid their death. I think the cup that was so distressing and troubling for Jesus was the spiritual suffering that he would endure as he would bear the sins of his people and as he would drink the cup of God's wrath to the last drop. And Jesus repeatedly prayed in verse 35 and 36 that the hour might pass from him, that the cup would be removed. And those are both metaphors for his death. So the question then is, how could Jesus want something different from the will of God the Father? How could Jesus want something different from the will of God the Father? How is that possible? He's been predicting three times, at least in Mark's gospel, that he would die on the cross and that he would rise again. So how do we come now just the moments and hours from his death that he's praying for God to take it away. I think it comes down to the fact that Jesus was truly God and truly man. As a man, he had a human will with limited knowledge. His prayer wasn't to do something different from God's will, but he prayed that if there was any possibility of fulfilling his mission as the Messiah without the cross, that he would take that, that route. He would take that course. That as a man, Christ cried out for an escape, but he wanted to, f to fulfill the Father's will even more. Jesus knew that God could do the impossible, the impossible here being making another way for salvation without him having to drink the cup. But we know from Mark's gospel, Mark 10, 45, the Son of Man came to die for the sins of many. And they've shown that, that God's plan and God's will to do the impossible is by gathering human beings into his kingdom through the death of the Son of Man as a ransom for many. And there's no other way. Jesus must drink the cup. The cup that he used to drink was full of sin and full of wrath. The cup Jesus would drink would make him to be sin. Like 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Jesus would have to drink a cup of sin and a cup of wrath. Jesus is our sin bearer. He took on our sin, which means that Jesus became the object of the Father's holy wrath against sin. God's wrath would be laid upon Jesus. And looking into the prospect of this cup was like Jesus seeing hell opening up, and he like staggered at this sight. And it's in this peaceful garden of Gethsemane, on the Mount of Olives, at midnight, Jesus turned to his Father, and all he can see is wrath. There's a cup of wrath. And the cup, it contains the abyss and the, the chasm that Jesus was now starting to experience 
the spiritual and cosmic and infinite disintegration that would happen on the cross. And Jesus felt all of this, and he staggered. Look at Isaiah chapter 51, verse 22. I want you to see this. Because it fulfills these words. This is a prediction about the suffering servant, the Messiah that, that Israel's looking for. And this scene fulfills what Jesus is starting to experience here in the Garden of, in the garden of Gethsemane. Isaiah 51, verse 22. It says, Thus says your Lord, Adonai, the Lord, Yahweh, your God, Elohim, who pleads the cause of his people. Get this. Behold, I have taken from your hand the cup of staggering, the bowl of my wrath you shall drink no more. You see how beautiful that is? So the question is, if the cup of staggering and the bowl of God's wrath has been taken away from God's people, where'd the cup go? Who's drinking the cup? It wouldn't disappear because God is just. So tell me, where did the cup of wrath go? It was poured onto Jesus. He took our cup. He took our bowl of wrath that we don't drink anymore. Jesus took it. It was poured onto him. God's own son took the punishment that you and I rightly deserved. You know, I've been at this church for over five years now. I love you all very much. But I'm not giving my son for you. <laughs> you know? But man, look at this love of the Father. Perfectly divine love of God. That he would sacrifice his own son to save you and to save me. This is the cup that Jesus took. And Jesus the Son knew that he would have to drink this cup. And he knew that he would be abandoned by the Father, left alone to atone for and to pay for the sin of every crime and every evil that there is in the world. And think of how broad that is. Every crime and every sin and every evil in the world, this is what Jesus was staring at the cup of. The cup of wrath the cup of God's anger and hatred of that sin, the sin of the world. How would you feel if you had to drink this cup? This is what brought Jesus to his knees and moved him to make this plea to the Father. If there's any other way, Father, I'll do that. Just remove this cup. But then he says, yet not what I will, but what you will. Which is why it's no surprise that Jesus is sweating blood and crying out for deliverance. It's no wonder that Luke 22 says that an angel was sent by the Father to strengthen Jesus. And yet in all of this, there's still a humble submission to doing the Father's will. And that was the supreme goal of Jesus throughout his life and ministry. You know, he says in other places, he says, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. And then he said, for I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And in the most amazing display of obedience, Jesus took the full cup of man's sin and of God's wrath upon man's sin. He looked into it, he staggered, and he shuddered, and then with the will of steel, he drank it. This is the beauty and uniqueness of Christianity the love of the Father is like nothing else. And the obedience of the Son is uncomprehensible. It's amazing. The song that we sing, that we're going to sing to close, it has a line that I think is just so beautiful. It says, The mystery of the cross I cannot comprehend. The agonies of Calvary. You, the perfect Holy One, crushed your Son who drank the bitter cup reserved for me. See, Jesus Christ is the perfect sacrifice who took our place 
for the punishment that our sins deserved. And we praise Jesus for this grace. This is how we can stand here because we're saved by his grace and his grace alone that comes to us as a perfect, beautiful gift of God. Amen? Amen. And now as we look to the third movement, the king's subjects are sleeping. The king's subjects are sleeping. So as Jesus is struggling in prayer for what he would endure, he comes to his most trusted, his, his most devoted disciples, his most beloved disciples, and he finds them asleep. You know, a few weeks ago, we were working through Mark 13, and there was a repeated command by Jesus that he spoke to his disciples. Remember what it was? Stay awake. Stay awake. Keep watch. And here we have Jesus bringing his inner circle with him in Gethsemane, not just for company, but he wanted them to learn and to pray for themselves. If they watched, and if they entered into prayer like Jesus did, they would have the strength to make it through what was coming. And they did watch for a little, but then since it was after midnight, they dozed off. Despite the loud praying and the prayerful combat of Jesus and the spiritual suffering that he was enduring, they still fell asleep. And now in these verses, the disciples, they failed to do what Jesus had commanded. So the first time he came to the three, he singles Peter out. Look at verse 37. And he came and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Could you not watch one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Isn't there kindness in these words? I mean, Jesus could have been like, hey, you just said that you were going to stay awake and you wouldn't deny me, but you can't even stay awake now. Jesus doesn't say that. He doesn't scold Peter. There's kindness here. I mean, Jesus knows human weakness. And he also knew that the disciples needed to pray or they would fall. And Jesus reminds the disciples to be on watch, to stay awake, to pray, because temptation is always lurking. And even those who are redeemed are still attached to sinful flesh, aren't we? We may be redeemed, but we're still attached to this, this fleshly body. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. The weakness of the flesh acts with great power, doesn't it? The flesh has great power to take us where we don't want to be. And isn't that the way when we sin, we say to ourselves, and how did, how did I end up in this place to be embracing sin? You see, the flesh is weak, and the weakness of the flesh is strong. It's a strong temptation to sin. And so Jesus knew that the disciples and us want to be strong for him, but he knew that we would fail. So look at verse 39. And again he went and prayed, saying the same words. And again he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were very heavy, and they did not know what to answer him. And he came the third time and said to them, Are you still sleeping and taking a rest? It is enough. The hour has come. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. Jesus went to them to make sure they were awake so that they could learn from him. The disciples failed three times to keep awake and to pray. The disciples fail. We fail. Who is the one that succeeds? It's Jesus. Jesus says the hour has come. What hour is that? The hour that he had prayed would pass. He said, Take this hour away, and now the hour is here because Jesus has accepted it. He accepted it. He went out to drink the cup and now to win the greatest victory ever. The disciples failed here, but we know from history that Peter died as a martyr, crucified upside down, that John died as, or that James died as a martyr, 
and that John was like a man of steel who lived to an old, old age but was persecuted and tortured along the way. So what made them change? It was the example of Jesus, right? So we, in the same way, have to look to Gethsemane where we see Jesus pray. Even though the disciples failed, we need to look at Jesus, the one who prayed with nerves of steel. You see, prayer strengthens us as followers of Christ. It's what we need the most. So we have to devote ourselves to regular daily prayer. You know, we're, we may be so busy, and we're talking about actually today in, in, a, in the prayer group that meets at 9 o'clock. And uh, someone was saying that they have so much to do and they're so discouraged that they don't have time to pray or that they, they couldn't pray. And so we're just praying for each other. And as, as, I was, as we were praying, I, I, came, I was thinking of this quote from Martin Luther who said, essentially, and I'll paraphrase, the more I have to do, the more I should pray. You know? And, and I think that's, that has to be the posture of all of our hearts because we can always say that we're busy and that we have things to do. But if we have so many things to do, then that means we have many more things to be praying over and praying for. So we have to be devoted to prayer. Because as we're devoted to prayer, it allows us to follow Jesus and to rely on him in each and every moment of our lives. So not only do we pray individually, for our own spiritual well-being, but we pray for other people. We pray for each other. I mean, fellow believers need to be strengthened in our faith. Like this morning, we were praying for each other. Like we do at community groups when we pray for each other. We need to pray for other members here at Winthrop Street. We need to pray for those who don't yet know Christ. We need to pray for our families who don't, you know, who don't know Jesus. See, prayer takes discipline. Discipline is another crisis in our world. We're losing it so fast. You know, we live in a, in a TikTok, Twitter, uh, social media era where our, our attention span is like 20 or 30 seconds max. And I'm guilty of it. But we need discipline to think, to be thoughtful, to be prayerful, to be mindful of the Lord Jesus and to, and to talk to him regularly and to pray to him, giving all of our needs to him, knowing that he hears us and that he's interceding for us. So we have a crisis. We need God to help us, don't we? And thankfully, he does. He's given us his Holy Spirit by grace to intercede for us and to pray for us, even in ways that we don't always know that we need to. And this is how we're strengthened as believers. And this is how we're strengthened as a church that we have his Holy Spirit to rely upon. So it's a beautiful sight to see. We look to Jesus, who is the one who prays with all the strength humanly possible in the world. And we look to him, and he identifies with us, the lonely one who's praying all alone. And don't you feel alone sometimes when you pray? We know that Jesus knows that too, and that Jesus felt that too. But we're not alone because we have the Spirit. We have each other. We don't need to be alone like Jesus was. So here's this image again. Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane. Why is that important? Why is that named? Gethsemane means olive press. So in order to make olive oil, the olive has to be crushed. It has to be pressed in order for the oil to come out. So think of the image here, like in the call to worship, Isaiah 53, which says, it was the will of the Lord to crush him. So the crushing of Jesus starts here at Gethsemane, the olive press, the place that the olives are pressed to get oil. What happens to Jesus here is he's pressed. He's pressed down to the point that blood seeps through his pores. Like Luke 22 says, being in agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. See the image? The olive oil is being pressed. Jesus is being pressed. The oil seeps out. The blood seeps out. But this is the blood that washes our sins away. You know, they know the place of Gethsemane where Jesus prayed. It was near to the temple. 
And in that day, Jesus would be able to see the temple from the Garden of Gethsemane. In the holy place of the temple, there's a golden menorah that's constantly lit, always burning for light. And the fuel for that light was olive oil. So in the first century, olives, they were used for food as well, but they were most used for lights because everyone had an olive oil lamp to light their home. So here's Jesus praying in an olive press where olives are being made into oil that, then, that can then be used for light. Now tell me, who is Jesus? The light of the world. He said, I'm the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. So at midnight, Jesus is praying in the pressing garden, which shows that he was crushed in order to become the light of the world that saves people from their sins. Isn't that beautiful? Isn't it wonderful to see how God's word just fits and is perfectly together for all of us? And what do we need in our darkened world? We need Jesus. We need light. He's the true light that offers eternal life to anyone who would trust in him. So if you have not yet ever trusted in Christ, come to him today. He'll offer you true life, a free gift of grace. He saves us. He's with us. He's near to us. And if you have been a believer in Christ for a long time, be encouraged. He's with you. You're not alone. He was pressed down. You may be feeling pressed down, but you can come to him because he knows everything that you've experienced. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we do praise you. We thank you for your obedience to the will of the Father, even though that will meant that you would be crushed, that you would be pressed like the olive was. And Lord Jesus, you were pressed and crushed in order to become the light of the world, the light that provides salvation to all and any who would come to you by faith. And so, Jesus, we come to you by faith this morning, knowing that you drank the cup, the bitter cup of wrath to take our sins away. And so, God, we, we praise you and we thank you with great joy and celebration that we are now free in Christ, free from the effects of sin, free from the slavery of sin, the bondage of the flesh, and we are now declared righteous because of all that you've done. Not only have you forgiven all of our sins, but you've made us righteous in your sight. You've given us your perfect life that we now have by faith. We praise you and thank you for all of your blessings. Lord Jesus, you're so good to us. Father God, you love us so much. We praise you and thank you in your beautiful name. Amen. Everybody would like to stand and please join us in singing, Thank You, Jesus.
Lord, we thank you for the encouragement of your word today. We're reminded to stay awake this week, Lord, uh, and by that we can be in your word and be in prayer for ourselves, for our loved ones, for one another, for this church, for our brothers and sisters in Christ, and for those that have yet to hear the good news, Lord. We're encouraged today. Uh, the news points to the need of a Savior, so whatever we read or uh, hear about this week, may it be reminded that the world needs Jesus, and if you know him as Savior, you have him, and so uh, praise God for that. We have an awesome week, and we come back together and proclaim the good news again next week, Lord. Encourage us, encourage us, and strengthen us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Go in Amen. peace. Amen.